All right. So today we're going to do something slightly different in terms of introducing a speaker. So Mike McGibbon, who is the lead instructor for the A6 or Basics course, he will do the introduction virtually. So Mike, if you're ready. Yeah. Greetings from uh, Tampa, Florida. So my name is Mike McGivern, and I am the uh, lead instructor for the Back to Basics course. Really excited today. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Sanji. Sajan Sani. Sorry about that. Um, no worry. Early on, so the, the Back to Basics course, we're, we're doing uh, mostly uh, uh, semiconductors with uh, the Skywater production uh, facility uh, and fab. Uh, but uh, Dr. Saini is the, uh, uh, one of the world's uh, leading experts in photonics and uh, is here today to talk about uh, some of the work that he's done and, uh, and how photonics has really revolutionized uh, today's modern world uh, with electronics. Uh, so with that horrible, I'm sorry for the introduction here. I was having some technical difficulties with the computer. Uh, I turn it over to you. Uh, Thank you, Matt. We're just getting the uh, laser pointer going. Excellent. We have photons. Nice to see all of you. Good afternoon. And uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, you know, I'll humbly say that um, uh, I wouldn't consider myself a world leading researcher in photonics. My boss, definitely. That's this fellow here, Lionel Kimmerling. Um, but I learned, I learned at his feet and uh, I'm a good pupil. And um, these days, what I really focus on a lot is uh, building educational materials. Uh, because this field of photonics is in this incredibly revolutionary moment where it's just radically and rapidly changing. And university curricula can't keep up. So we have to try to start building a lot of non-traditional ways to skill up. And the jargony word that people will use, um, especially if you want to get good funding from the federal government, is you say we're trying to reskill or we're trying to upskill. That's even fancier. We're trying to upskill uh, not only college curricula, but people who are in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s who are working out there in industry because their jobs are so rapidly changing. I'll say from my own personal example, I got into this topic in the late 90s because I took a class as an undergrad. I was a physics student and uh, I took a class with Professor Garlam Yip at McGill University. And uh, he sold me on this technology. He said, this is the coolest thing to be able to control light so that it's not spewing out uncontrollably, if you will, from light sources, right? Um, akin to the way it comes from the sun, if you will, but to be able to guide it like water in a pipe, to make it make 90 degree turns, do loops on itself and make it interfere with itself in a controlled way. And I thought, wow, that is, that is really, really cool intellectually. That's why I went into this. I never dreamed when I finished my PhD, that was in the year, 2004. I never dreamed how quickly this technology would start to become off the shelf stuff that you buy and install in places. And that's exactly what's happened in the last 10 years. Photonics has literally become a manufacturing mature technology. And so that's why we're in this moment of revolution I'm talking about where things are changing really, really fast. And I'm gonna show you some of those revolutions here. Okay, so with that little opener, uh, let's get started. Walt Disney fans. I don't know, they don't draw anymore, right? Everything is CGI. So these are from the days when you had old school animation, but it's, it's just a playful image I'm putting up to say that really our relationship to light, right? Goes into ancient prehistory. And really it is this fundamental source. And as these colors are trying to uh, suggest by emotional affect, right? It's the source of warmth and it's the source of sight, right? Our life, uh, our societies have evolved around its presence due to the sun, right? And going back to ancient man, right? We marked our passage of time, right? According to this, and we decided to dress ourselves depended where we were on the latitude of this planet accordingly. And then at a certain moment, we had primitive engineers. People suddenly discovered how to create something called fire. And with that, suddenly you could have light on demand, right? So that's, I would say fire and perhaps weapons are the first technologies that our civilization created, right? Engineered, right? To repurpose nature, right? So that we could use stuff on demand. 
And from there, we come to this. This is the modern world, right? And this is a, a composite shot. Many of you may have seen this taken from NASA satellites. And I think it's a stunning nonverbal way of summarizing what the human species has achieved, right? We've literally transformed the face of the planet, right? You know, people talk about um, the World Wide Web and cloud computing as this great virtual world. But the way I look at it, to me, this is a kind of virtual world we imposed over nature, right? These are the majority of these light sources here all come from cities. Some of these things in some local spots are uh, gas wells that are on fire and releasing a lot of light, but the majority of all this is city lights, right? We've literally transformed the face of this planet and all of that came out of our minds. So that's why I really think that we live in a man-made world, which is really our virtual dreams made real. It's, it's a remarkable thing. That's just the visible spectrum. Buried under this, humming silently, is a global network of strands of glass called optical fiber, right? And optical fiber is the reason why you guys have smart mobile phones in your pockets, frankly, right? This is what allows data to travel around the circumference of the planet with such negligible amounts of loss that you can literally not only have pristine telepresence conversations, but you can store data uh, in data centers that might be located here in Europe or across the continental North America. And you could be sitting here in Boston and accessing all it with a latency, a delay of less than seconds. And that's a remarkable achievement. This is all due to light, right? This is an information superhighway that is running along cables that have been dropped across oceans along the edges of continents, right? That routes light all over this planet. It is an ultimate engineering achievement and it doesn't stop there. I talked about your phones, wireless technology and the birth of smartphones and what we call mobile computing only exists because of that backbone, that super highway of cables, right? Your cell phones, and this is a map of cell phone towers, your cell phones tap into towers. So these bright lights are a false color image signifying the density of cell phone towers distributed across the planet, right? And those cell phone towers then plug into that super highway at some stage to relay information, right? So we have really rebuilt the planet. And you know, if you could look at the planet, not only with visible eyes from space, but microwave eyes, right? You would see this a buzz with activity, all invented by our creativity. And how does integrated photonics play into this today? So first I'll tell you a little bit about some of the drivers for integrated photonics and the cloud computing world that is aptly summarized by so much of this. We've all emerged out of this very serious health crisis, right? The COVID pandemic uh, period of the last uh, three and a half years. And as many of you have had the experience, a lot of your interactions have gone virtual as people colloquially say the world has gone Zoom, right? But nestled against that is all of the other things we do from acquiring things off Amazon, right? To watching Netflix shows or Disney Plus or whatever, you know, HBO Max. Is it called Max now, I think? It's changed its name too, right? All of that stuff that you do, right? Represents a two-way communication that's distinct from the way TV used to be. TV was a broadcast mode. You put an antenna out there or a coaxial cable brought the signal in. You didn't go back the other way to say, I wanna watch a certain program. You got what you got at 7.30 p.m. in the afternoon. You got what you got at 9 p.m. at night, right? But that two-way communication, all of that is made possible by that optical fiber network that feeds into integrated photonics. Now, right now, in the year 2023, integrated photonics is in a uh, rapid development phase on these four application areas. And they all tie ultimately into this vision of literally everything having a computer chip embedded into it, literally from your refrigerator. And I'm not joking when I say that, literally your refrigerator to the lights in your house, to your cars becoming smart roving data centers because they're packed with so many sensors. And I'll talk about cars in a couple of minutes. So all those kinds of smart products are referred to as the, um, the endpoints of an internet of things. Their data all feeds into that 
fiber optic network that I showed you, that superhighway spanning the surface of the earth, so that data can be relayed, stored, retrieved, processed at will. That all gets made possible by these things called data centers run by big companies like Google, uh, Amazon Web Services, and Facebook. They're basically a big warehouse of computers, racks and racks and racks of computers. And the technical term we use for those kind of computers is we call them servers, okay? So they're storing and they're rerouting all of the data that these kinds of smart products, and your phones are really, I would say, the first phase, the first generation of acquiring that kind of smart information, your laptops, acquiring all that information and then seeking to store it in these data centers, right? And so these data centers are rapidly growing around the surface of the planet and they take up a lot of power. And that's where integrated photonics has suddenly become critical to helping these things pay their electricity bills. The other big application areas are, as your cell phones get faster and faster, the wavelength of, uh, of light, electromagnetic waves that they're used have to go to higher and higher frequencies. Anyone here know what frequencies your current cell phones work in? What, what uh, rough ballpark range? 2.4 what? Yes, exactly, gigahertz, exactly. So these are technically within the microwave regime, right? What you would call the so-called microwave regime. And microwave can mean, you know, it's, it's a large range. There's a certain range of frequencies that are used in your microwave oven, for example. That's not what's used by your phone. Your phone operates in a slightly different spectrum of, uh, of the electromagnetic, uh, Field, exactly, right? Now there is a push to go to even higher carry frequencies, factor of 100 higher, to try to get the 100 gigahertz, 300 gigahertz, right? And that is a regime that you start to call sub terahertz. When you get to 1000 gigahertz and up, you're technically entered the terahertz regime, okay? And when you can do that, you think we can do a lot with your phones right now, dropping maps and finding a pizza place down the street, Imagine you could do that 500 times faster. Right now, I can't imagine why would you need that computing power. But a very famous uh, manager at IBM around 1980 said, why would people need personal computers? I can't imagine why you would need a personal computer in your home, right? The applications will come and they will come shockingly fast, right? We may really need that fast Wi-Fi capacity and you can't get that fast. You can't get the sub terahertz without integrated photonics. LIDAR or three-dimensional imaging is when you're firing pulses of laser light and you're timing how long it takes them to hit something across the room and then reflect back. And if you can do that with angular resolution, you can not only say how far away that chair is, but you can also begin to map out the shape of that chair. You get a three-dimensional perspective shot. Tomorrow's cars, and by tomorrow, I'm literally talking only five to eight to 10 years away, are trying to incorporate LIDAR into their headlights or somewhere along the front, right? So that these cars can begin to map out the streets and that data can be fed into a computer behind the dashboard so that the driver can take their hands off the steering wheel. Self-autonomous cars require LIDAR, and LIDAR is only possible, this kind of automotive LIDAR, it's only possible, some argue, right? It's a bit of an open field of debate, but some argue it's only really possible at a cost-effective margin using integrated photonics. Otherwise, it's just really expensive, and it's just the rich who are going to have it. If you want to make this thing available in every single car, you got to leverage the semiconductor industry's ability to build things cheaply. Right, and integrated photonics is based on semiconductors. The last is sensing, gas sensing and uh, medical lab sensing. We all got very acclimated to these kinds of COVID test diagnostic things, right? You know, you would swab your nose and you would do that test and then you would throw it into the trash. Imagine that you have a sort of next generation souped up version of that where a little bit of saliva, a little bit of sweat, right? That you just swab off and you can determine whether you're pre-diabetic, right? The earliest generation of using photonics in medical sensing like this is already in hospitals right now. It's those red colored clips they put on your finger when you go for your general checkup. You know, they take your weight and then they put that clip. Anyone know what those devices are called? 
Yep. You got it. You got it. It's a pulse oximeter, right? And uh, I won't go into the, the, the origins of what exactly that means, other than to say they shine red laser light through your finger and they measure its absorption when it comes out the other side. Because we're kind of transparent, right? And anyone who's played with the flashlight realizes that when you shine a flashlight against your, your finger and you look on the other side, your nail kind of glows. That's because light is transmitting through you. Pulse oximeters use that. They measure the absorption of red laser of red light, LED light, not laser light. And uh, from that, they can back out the amount of oxygen in your bloodstream. That's pretty amazing. That's all because of photonics. And this represents the next more ambitious version of that. Okay, so what we're gonna do for the next about half an hour, I'm gonna give you guys kind of a lightning tour of what are the reasons that photonics and specifically integrated photonics is needed in these four areas. All right, here we go. So first up, just the basics, right? This thing I talked about wave guiding, where does that all come from? It comes from Snell's law. So if you guys, you know, these are quotidian images I put up here, right? Just to, uh, just to draw your recollection, how you've seen, if you put something in a glass of water, it seems as if it's broken compared to the part that's sticking out into air. So putting a pen in a glass of water is a common example. And here's an example of a man standing in a pool and it looks as if his head is severed and, and dislocated from the rest of his body, right? That optical effect is because of light bending when it travels from air into water or the reverse direction, right? And that phenomena of refraction, right? You can take advantage to its ultimate limit. I'll show here with a little animated cartoon. When a ray of light inside glass hits its surface at a steep angle, it refracts or, or bends as it exits into air. But if the ray travels at a shallow angle, it'll bend so far that it stays trapped bouncing along inside the glass. Under the right condition, something normally transparent to light and instead not into the book. That is magical, if you ask me, right? That last image, just consider that. So this is a piece of glass, right? Just like we have on windows, there's a piece of glass over there, right? Covering something. Glass transmits, light goes through it, right? Except if your light is not incident on the flat plane, but if you could rotate it by 90 degrees and have it incident on the edge. And then one more thing, you gotta have it incident at certain angles, okay? If you do that, the light actually gets trapped inside the pane of glass, travels up along it, and you would be standing here looking through this glass and you would have no idea. It's like an invisibility cloak. This is wave guiding. Isn't that the coolest thing? You can guide light and nobody even knows you're doing it. Have you guys seen these exit signs? They're like these rectangles of glass and they glow in green or red and they say exit. So have you guys ever wondered where's the glow coming from? All right, so this is a little quiz moment. I'll give you a hint. It has to do with this thing here. Anyone want to hazard a while to guess what's happening? Yep. Yeah, let's say it's a block of glass, right? Okay, so there's light shining through it. All right. And, and then any other ideas about why it's glowing E-X-I-T? It's close. It's close. You're almost there. Anyone else? Yep. So you guys are almost there. When you say frosted, right? Um, technically what it is, is it's parts of the glass that are damaged or, or they might call it scoring. Like you take an abrasive on the glass. Like let's say you take some steel wool, right? And you run it on the glass really hard. That surface where you'll run the steel wool on the glass, you damage the glass. And this light that is invisibly traveling through the glass, when it passes by that damaged region, it leaks out. It's, it's almost like, you know, taking an ax to a pipe. I'm not saying you do that, right? And have water come spewing out, right? So it, it's, it's the same concept. You inflict the local damage. And if you make that damage in the form of the letter E, the light comes spewing out in the form of the letter E and you see a glowing E. And so they just do E, X, I, T. They score the glass in that shape and you get these beautiful exit displays. So you've been seeing waveguiding around you for years now. 
All right, so that's the basics, just to get you all on the same page. When a ray of light into oh. Maybe I gotta just tap here to move on. There we go, okay. And here's a little animation video to show you. When you trap light like that in materials, right, you can get really nitty gritty and think of it as a vector field, right? For any of you who have started to uh, take classes in electromagnetic theory and you're, and you're beginning to learn about light as an interconnecting set of two vector fields, an oscillating electric field and an oscillating magnetic field, you can model that kind of vector field as it propagates. And this uh, undulation here that looks like a skipping rope, that's just signifying, that's a schematic to signify the idea of something that's periodically varying. What's periodically varying? The electric field strength, the magnitude of that E field, the magnitude of that magnetic field. And as they're oscillating, they're propagating through space at close to the speed of light. It's no longer exactly the speed of light because when you have light travel through materials, they slow down a little bit, their speed slows down, okay? So it's traveling through these along one dimension and the, uh, the confinement of these square or circular structures, if you make them smaller, the light kind of squeezes out, but that doesn't mean you lose it. It still travels in the structure. It's just part of it is sitting outside of the, uh, of the confined structure, the confining structure. So when you have light traveling through that pane of glass, a little bit actually of it is spilling out into the air, but it doesn't travel to your eyes. It kind of decays away and that's called evanescence, right? And so that's why you don't see it. But that's an important feature of light that it doesn't literally stay inside this, like water stays inside a pipe, right? It's, it's as if like there was a layer of water vapor traveling outside the pipe along with the water inside the pipe. That's the kind of the visual that I'd want you guys to think about. And then what you can do with this, you can start to pattern structures on a silicon wafer chip on a length scale that is on the order of microns, which starts to allow you to build interference effects based on the wavelength of light itself. So if you're working with the wavelength of light that is in the range of 1.55 microns, and why do they have that wavelength? I'll tell you in a sec. But if you build structures that have kind of comparable length scales to 1.55 microns, you can start to have light do interference. And so here's a little video I'll show you guys. So what you're gonna see in this video is light traveling inside a, a giant optical fiber, a strand of glass, and then it couples into a silicon wafer on which there is this tiny waveguide structure. And then it goes through something called the splitter. And then it goes into a thing called the phase shifter. And in this phase shifter, if you could um, apply a little battery voltage to one of these two arms, only to one, not the other, you can actually influence the speed of light. You can slow it down just a touch. And then you could have those two waves recombine. And if these two parts of the light recombine, but one of them has been slowed down by half a cycle of light, when they combine, they interfere with each other. And literally, you can build Morse code, right? So the way, you know, you might take a flashlight and you switch it on or off, or you go like this with your hand, this is a more sophisticated version of that right? You slow things down in this one arm and then you recombine them. And depending on how much you toggle that battery's voltage, right? You can make the light switch on or off. And so either it propagates or if it totally interferes, it scatters out of the plane and just kind of diffuses away. Okay. This is how we turn light into signals, right? And with uh, digital computers, you guys have likely heard about data being transformed, tra sorry, transmitted as bits, bits of data per second, right? And if you add up a bit stream of data that corresponds to information, right? Stored on hard drives, processed by computers. So a bit of data uh, you build by a string of ones and zeros, logical ones and logical zeros. If you take light and you cause interference so that nothing transmits out, the absence of light is considered analogous to a logical zero. When you uh, retweak that voltage on the arm so that the light now totally is in sync and it all comes out, that's considered the analogous to a digital one. And so this is how with light, you can build a code, right? To transmit data. Any questions about that?
Okay. So based on that, all of these technologies start to get built. So here at the center is the computer chip, right? Which traffics an information in the form of bits per second. And it's stored in data centers. It uh, is built inside your uh, smartphones into smart infrastructure now, ultimately internet of things that started to kind of come into smart homes. And so literally 1980 onwards, people started to say we're in an information age. And now people are starting to call it the data era because we are just showered in a lot of data. And a lot of people cynically say a lot of it is useless data, right? Um, I mean, I think about myself, when I used to take photographs with a, um, a traditional camera that had camera film in it, I would be very judicious about taking a good shot or two, right? Because it cost me money to buy film. Now with this thing here, I have a child. I'm just constantly hitting the button and trying to catch that beautiful shot of him, right? And then I'm lazy. I don't delete the 12 photos I took when only one of them is the one I care about. So we store a lot of useless data. And I hope you guys figure out as engineers smart ways that we clean up. You know, the way you clean up your attic, your bedroom, all of us need to clean up because why are we storing a lot of useless data in these servers and running electricity bills, right? We need to find smart ways to do data management. And that's something you guys should think about in your careers going ahead. All right. So in the next 20 minutes, I'll give you guys a fast rundown of these four areas where integrated photonics is coming into play. So the first one are these data centers that I talked about. These things get really, really uh, energy intensive, right? Here's some numbers. A good spec for a mid-sized data center is that it run at about less than 20 megawatts of power, typically on a given day, okay? There's peaks and lulls, but sort of an average number, right? And that would correspond maybe to about 80 watts of power to a given computer chip core that is sitting inside a server, inside these, these racks that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Now, the NSA here in the US, they have a data center that operates at 65 megawatts, right? So that's above that, well above. And that's about the power on average it takes to light up all the homes in Salt Lake City. So that is how power intensive data centers get, right? That's a pretty impressive number. And out of that electricity, there's a chunk of it, right? That gets dissipated as heat inside data centers. Why? Because these uh, racks, they have switches at the top that are trafficking information back and forth between each other at massive, massive speeds. And the reason they do it is to make sure that everything you guys access on your Google Docs, right? Things you store online like photographs, Facebook, uh, doing searches on Google, that it's millisecond latency. So that you don't have to suffer with maybe what we might call kind of an information version of a brownout. Like imagine every time you sat down with your smartphone to search for a place to eat, right? you had to wait about 12 seconds for the data to come back, right? And tell you, oh, there's a place about 50 feet away, right? You would start to get very annoyed over time, right? All of that waiting and slowdown. It's that human appetite for instant on-demand delivery. That means data centers are constantly shuttling information inside them. They're moving tracks of data around to make sure that that delay, that latency, and when you're pulling information, right? is not going to be a problem. They're constantly moving data around so that if something happens where one of these servers blows a gasket, if you will, to use a vernacular word, right? Something gets damaged. You don't catastrophically lose whatever was stored there, right? There's a copy of it somewhere else. So redundancy and reduction of latency means that data centers are constantly moving information just inside their four walls. And then there's the information they send out of the data center all the way to your smart devices. All of that movement of data, right, is happening on copper cables between these computers. And those copper cables, they start to heat up. They start to heat up. When you are moving data at very, very fast bit rates, what you are doing is you are toggling an electrical signal to get those digital logical ones and zeros, 
okay? A pulse of electricity, no electricity. In a, in a simple way, you can think about it. So that's an AC alternating current running along a copper cable. When you start to increase the frequency of your AC, copper being a metal, it pushes the E field, the electromagnetic field rather, associated with the current to the boundaries. And so your current starts traveling on the outer edges of the copper wire and it becomes really resistive and you get heat dissipation. So that old Kirchhoff's law is, uh, what is it? It's power dissipation from Kirchhoff's law is equal to I squared R, that's it, right? It goes to the square of current, right? And the resistance, the R in it, Think of the R as being frequency dependent. So the faster you're oscillating an AC signal, the higher up the R goes in a cable wire, in a copper wire, okay? And you start to get a lot of heat dissipation. As a result, the cables get hot. Also, the computer chips, which have copper metal lines inside them, those metal lines get hot. So computer chips get really hot too. So you've got to cool down your chip. You do this with fans. You guys have likely seen computer fans spinning, right? You've got to cool down and then you've got to run air conditioners or like Facebook has done with one of their data centers, they've built it above the Arctic Circle in Europe, right? And they basically open the window so that cold air is constantly flowing through. I mean, imagine working there, you just have to constantly wear a snow coat, right? But they're trying to just keep everything cool and not have it overheat because if it gets too prohibitively heat, well then the rubber, um, the rubber covering on hoses will start to melt and reflow, right? You'll start to have other damages occur, right? So number one, you got a lot of heat dissipation from AC current electricity. Number two, you run up your electrical bill even more if you've got to run air conditioners or fans to cool everything down. So this is like a runaway process of consuming a lot of power, right? It's been projected and it's an almost 20 year old projection by this communications technology roadmap, CTR, that if you get rid of all of the copper cables running between these servers and these racks, you can save more than 45% of this lost optical power because you won't be using uh, electrical signals that are AC signals connecting them. You'll be using pulses of laser light like I was talking a moment ago. And pulses of laser light, when they travel in optical fiber, negligible dissipation. How negligible? The number is 0 0.02 dB of loss per kilometer. That really doesn't mean much, right? But to give you a sense, you could have a, um, a firefly, right? At one edge of an optical fiber in uh, central New Jersey, okay? And you could run that optical fiber all the way down to Princeton University campus. And if you took a peek through the other end, you could see the light from the firefly. That's how little light gets lost when it moves through a strand of glass. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And so that's why if you can cut the electrical consumption, the power loss, rather I mean to say by 50% and no longer have to have air conditioners in there, the big driver for Facebook and Google is they are saving a lot of money. They are also having an environmental impact. So these are called scope impacts. If you guys ever look these up for climate change, scope one, scope two, scope three. Scope one are, uh, are sources that generate greenhouse gases. And uh, an ugly little secret about data centers I'll share with you guys is many of them will have a coal-fired power plant on standby. Isn't that amazing? Such a high-tech technology and you got a coal-fired power plant sitting next door to it. Why? because you don't want those brownouts I was talking about. If there ever is a loss in power, you can fire up a coal fire power plant from its quiescent state, right? It's low operating state to full operation so fast and get it to stabilize, right? Boom, you get that backup electricity almost on demand. So those are the ugly realities. You know, if we demand that we don't want information brownouts, then you start to have greenhouse gas emitting power sources co-located with data centers, all right? So those are serious things to think about, right? How can you guys clean up these technologies? And an important part here is getting rid of all these copper cables, replacing them with optical fiber carrying pulses of laser light. So let me move on and talk about the next technology area. Um, this is just a, a fun note that I'll circle back to in a couple of minutes where 
those racks I talked about, typically they have a computer inside it where a computer is made up of these four major components, a CPU, memory, memory, right? Random access memory, right? Long-term hard drive storage on magnetic media and what's called an accelerator for specialized functions. And now people are trying to crack those computers into, into subcomputer units so that you have parts of these packaged together. And so the hard drive is spaced apart from the CPU and the accelerator, for example, right? And the reason you wanna do this is so that as we start to move towards more AI type computations, there are some workflows that might require a lot of graphics calculations and some that don't, right? And so you wanna try to use parts of all the computers sitting inside your data center strategically. Right? It's as if you have like different kind of caliber of neurons with which to do your thinking, right? And you wanna be able to use the right ones adequately, right? And that's a way to keep your electricity bill from going up. So there's a lot of cool things happening in electrical engineering. If you guys are curious to explore those careers where here on the electrical front, they're trying to design smarter computers with this notion of disaggregation, breaking a computer into these subcomputer units, or you can work in photonics. Right, which takes care of the complementary business of all that heat dissipation. All right, I'm gonna skip that part over. Uh, this is a plot that summarizes a lot of what we've been talking about. What you see here is a plot of information capacity, bits per second that various man-made technologies have delivered right, in the last century, last hundred years plus. This is with the birth of radio, uh, the uh, wireless telegraph, sorry, the wired telegraph, right? Moving into then eventually coaxial cables that would deliver TV signals to, uh, to television sets uh, and then microwave systems. In the 1970s, when people started to replace copper telephone wires between cities with um, glass strands and have these pulses of laser light pass through them, look at this, the ability to deliver data has a discrete jump. It's like a disruptive technology. It's way faster than an AC electrical signal. And you'll notice the slope is different. It moves at a different slope. So the technology is getting better at a faster rate. This is the big reason that optical fibers have become that information superhighway I was talking about. And then there's a second jump. This is the coolest thing. In a glass strand of fiber, I was telling you, you can shine a pulse of laser light, right? Now, let's just take um, the colors of the rainbow, right? Red through violet. So each of those are a different wavelength of light. You could modulate a signal on red light, and you could modulate a second signal on blue light, and you could shine both of those through the same strand of glass and they don't talk to each other. They're like ships in the night, like ghostly things. They just both travel along the same highway, but they don't interact with each other. And at the other end, you can use optical interference with light to selectively only pull away the red light, send it to a computer, and then you can do optical interference a bit further down to pull away the blue light and send it to another computer. So what that means is, is a second disruptive step occurred where people started packing many kinds of wavelengths of laser light into the same strand of glass. And so it's like, it was like this incredible thing, like you suddenly got data capacity for free. You didn't have to dig up those glass strands that you had set across the Atlantic Ocean. You just use the same strand of glass, but you just, instead of having one laser insert pulsed light, now you could put 60, 100, and now they're even going to even more, all through the same strand. Ultimately, there is a limit um, because remember a little bit of light does get lost in the strand and we are reaching those limits now that if you pack too much laser light into a glass strand, it will start to heat up. But the capacity, look at the leap, how much more it is than electricity. This is incredible. This is what photonics does for you. And here what you see in contrast with the metal wire is its data rate, um, for a given data rate, you'll see this drop. So as you go to a longer distance, longer length of wire, you can only carry a lower data rate because if you try to oscillate that AC signal any faster, it gets lossy, right? 
With light, the line is flat. Any length scale, whether it's a centimeter or a kilometer, you can carry about the same data rate on it with a pulsed laser light signal. All right, let's talk about application number two, which is, uh, oh, I'll take a moment. This is kind of fun. I'll just show this guys to you. So remember I was saying to you guys that chips are getting hot too. Computer chips are getting hot too because they got all these copper wires on them. Secondly, chips are also getting hot because the transistor that's inside the chip is no longer getting smaller. For a lot of years, you guys have heard of something called Moore's Law? So Moore's Law was this incredible trend that saw every 18 months, they were able to make the features of a computer chip. And the most fundamental feature of it, I would say, is the transistor. They could make it smaller, and then they could pack those features closer together. So the chips got denser, right? And they, within a given, um, within a given size chip, you therefore packed more transistors, more, more functionality, right? It's like a bigger brain computer chip. That all stopped around 2005. Transistors got so small, they hit a limiting stage. You make them any smaller and they don't work well anymore. They, they start suffering from something called leakage current. It becomes non-negligible. And the only way to fight that then is that you have to apply a little bit more electrical voltage to a transistor. Whenever you apply electricity to anything, there's always a little heat dissipation. Prior to 2005, transistors were getting small and that voltage was getting small too. As of 2005, those have stopped. The voltage doesn't get smaller anymore, but people are building bigger and bigger computer chips. So they're getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And it's almost like it's almost like urban planning. Computer chips are now becoming like cities that are too big for their own good. And they're getting so hot. 25 years ago, you could have a computer chip sit on this uh, PCB board, right? Inside a computer slot. And uh, it would get hot, but because you know it was uh, next to air, it would just kind of give off the heat into air and it would cool down. Not anymore. Since the 2000s, you have to put these big copper things on top of it that suck the heat away because copper is a very good heat conductor, right? And then you had to also put fans. And now those fans in the 2020s, the chips are so incredibly hot that you've got to build very fast fans and those take more electricity. It's that same problem I was just talking about with the data centers, right? And so now you've got engineers whose jobs are to figure out how to build efficient fans fans that aren't noisy. Because if a fan is noisy, guys, that's electrical power that's causing some kind of friction and that's creating noise. That's, op that's audio power, right? That's wasted power. You want a noiseless fan that you can barely hear. That's a good fan, right? So now you've got, you've got to hire people from you know, mechanical engineering and other disciplines, right? For the computer industry, because you got to learn how to flow, how to pull away heat more efficiently and how to make better fans, right? This is what I mean by a runaway process, right? Computer chips, as they get more complex, if we can't solve the heat problem at the chip level by getting rid of some of those copper lines, drawing heat away with photonic parts, you get into situations like this. So you guys have heard about this language, multi-core? Have any of you heard of this? It's like if you buy your laptops, they say you have like a P5 chip or a P7 chip. You've heard those kinds of terms, right? The P5, P7, what it means is we no longer build one single mega chip. We build five small chips or seven small chips. Each of them doesn't get quite as hot. And then they connect to one another. The connections are heating up and that's where you need to put photonics in. So really the future of the computer chip is kind of like a city with a highway system. You can think of the local roads, right? In a city like, like here, Boston, as the electrical lanes, the copper wires carrying electricity in local neighborhoods of a computer chip. And then lying above it is a super highway that lets you get across the city in record time. And that's the integrated photonics that's doing that stuff. Now, this issue about heat dissipation, it has a big role to play next up. Oh, let me just show you this. This is just a lovely image of showing these incredibly dense features 
So you guys have probably seen these mind boggling images of computer chips that look like modern art, right? The sheer density of things. We can now build things with that kind of density with photonic devices as well, co-located on computer chips. The technology now has gotten just as mature as the computer chip industry. And so you can pack a lot of little tiny devices in that can manipulate light the way I was showing you in that animated video a couple of minutes ago. And there are places um, like a place called the AIM Photonics Institute that builds these chips and is going to start putting them into university classrooms so that in your undergrad curricula, you can do experiments with these light chips. So I'm curious, uh, anyone, uh, you guys are uh, at the, the sophomore level or junior level? Seniors? Okay, okay. So pretty soon you will have the opportunities to get to play with cool things like this, right? In your labs. That idea of uh, disaggregating that we talked about in data centers, right? So the computer chip industry is now doing that to computer chips where they're like localizing those functions of memory storage, and CPU into local neighborhoods. And that breakup of a chip now, they call it a chiplet, where you have a series of smaller chiplets that together work in tandem. And where integrated photonics can play a role, guys, is as that super highway I was talking about, connecting these local neighborhoods to one another. Right? So that's the future. That's the stuff you guys will be designing when you go out there into jobs. So this is the Meteor Lake chip, hot off the press, right, from this year. All right, now the other area, that we were talking about was wireless. Let me move on to that. It's the same fundamental problem. Right now, your cell phones, they send a signal to towers. And from the towers, they pick up those uh, two, or two gigahertz or so frequencies, right? They turn it into an electrical signal, an AC electrical signal that travels down a copper coax cable, right? And then goes to a base station to be processed and then put into an optical fiber network and then sent to another country. And there it goes back on an antenna and then it goes to your relative's phone. And that's how you talk to each other, right? Your signal goes from your phone to an antenna on a tower. It goes down the tower. It travels on some optical fiber superhighway to another tower. From there, it goes to the other person's phone. Those towers now can no longer carry incredibly high rates of wireless data once you get to 6G. So you guys have all heard about 5G, right? Has anyone heard about 6G? The first time I heard about 6G was maybe 18 months ago, and I thought, oh, that's just embarrassing. You're just making up stuff. But it's now legit. The federal government is funding 6G research, right? And that is moving to these hundreds of gigahertz that we're talking, the sub-terahertz regime. And when you get to those to those uh, regimes of frequency, when an antenna takes that signal and turns it into an AC current, the loss along a coax cable that runs a distance of 10 to 30 feet can become enormous, right? It can, so these are numbers that are called dB, measures of loss, right? Three dB means you've lost half your power. So look, you can have towers that might have up to 90 dB loss, you're just gonna lose most of your signal. So where photonics comes in now is right up there at that antenna. When you pick up the signal, oh, there's the, there's the antenna. Right up there at this antenna, when you pick up your wireless signal, you need to immediately turn it into a pulse of laser light so that it's no longer an electrical signal that's running down the length of this pole. Because 90 dB, by the time you get to this pole, your signal is just all dissipated away into heat. Instead, pulses of laser light start traveling down an optical fiber. And then from here, they just go directly into an optical fiber network. Right? This is a big place where a lot of research has to happen that you guys can make happen in the next 10 years. It's very exciting stuff. And you know the pipe dream vision that people have are these kinds of beautiful maps where you can start to build very directional antennas that are pickling, picking up wireless signals from local neighborhoods and only those neighborhoods. It's, it's not like traditional radio that just broadcasts in all directions isotropically. You can have these kinds of directionalized broadcasts, right? And they call this spatial multiplexing. 
So where you had this idea of many colors of laser light traveling down an optical fiber, not interacting, you could have these highly focused beams from your cell phones, almost like pencil, pencil film beams that are traveling and not interfering with other people's signals. And it opens up information capacity. You can get a lot more wireless signal when you do stuff like that. All of that is only possible with integrated photonics. And ultimately they have this vision that cities will just be glowing with all of these hundreds of terahertz wireless signals. Now a fun way, let me show you a quick image and then I'll circle back to some of this other stuff and then we'll wrap up. A fun way that people are hoping to control wireless signals like that is by building these kinds of antenna arrays on something the size of a nickel. And by using that concept of phase delay that I was talking about, you can have um, light be routed with a little bit of a delay, and then it goes into an, ele an element that turns it into a wireless signal. And if the wireless signal coming out of here has a little delay relative to here, to here, to here, you can exploit those delays to change the direction of your beam. It's like when you stand in a pond, and if you drop two pebbles, you see the ripples interfere with one another and start to form these funny patterns. If you had 10 pebbles and a bunch of you stood and you dropped the pebbles out of sync, right? One guy drops his first pebble, then the next guy drops, then the next person does there too, there too. You could actually see, you can change the direction of where the ripples add up to. They can go this way. And if you change the, the out of phase in the opposite direction, you know, the person at the far end drops his or her pebbles first, you can suddenly make the ripples direct the other way. Isn't that amazing? It's, and you're doing that without mechanically holding something and moving something. You're just using interference effects. So this is how you can do those cool things with antennas, like multiplexing. Uh, one quick check. Uh, Bob, should we be wrapping up in the next two, three minutes? No problem, no problem. So what I'll tell you guys briefly about is those other two application areas. I'll tell you about LiDAR. So this is the dream that you can have these autonomous vehicles, right? That are firing these pulses of laser light using wavelengths that are invisible to the human eye, right? And they can judge these distances. And if they can raster scan as a function of angle and you use that same interference effect that I just talked about, now you're doing it with laser light. You can move a laser beam using this interference effect as well. Then you can raster scan all of this angular extent and figure out the features. Is this a car ahead of me or is this a squirrel that just came running across the street, right? As a result, you can then make, take intelligent decision-making uh, uh, decisions in here. You might even have a, a Wi-Fi signal that links to an AI computer that does some of that heavy thinking for you. And then it just tells you, tells the car, slow down at this rate of deceleration. This is where autonomous driving vehicles are heading towards, right? And LiDAR, if you want to make it cost efficient and tiny, the size of a quarter, you have to use integrated photonics in order to make it cost effective to put into the front of a car next to its headlights. Have you guys seen in modern cars, when you put your car in reverse, you have a camera go on? Have you guys been able to figure out where the camera is on the back of your car? So I, I'm curious, where is it? I haven't found it yet on mine. It's, oh, is that where it is? I'm gonna go explore with a flashlight tonight. Thanks for telling me. So, but that's amazing, right? That that camera is so small, right? That it can be overlooked. And it's that same idea here. You wanna build LiDAR chips that are so small, they can just be overlooked. And you might have them not only in the front of the car, you might have them circling the entire car so that you do like 3D maps all around the car. Pretty cool stuff. The last thing I'll mention about is chemical sensing. Oh, actually, this is a fun thing. Um, who amongst you has face recognition on your smartphones? So that's LiDAR, guys. Your phone, right, is it's got something buried under its glass plate that looks like this, that has something called a VIXEL, a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. It's firing pulses of laser light. They hit your face bounce back with the time it takes to bounce back it judges how far your face is from the phone and then it raster scans it over your whole face 
And that's how it gets a map of your face. And that's how your face becomes a locking feature, right? And you don't even notice it because it's a wavelength that your eyes can't see. It still kind of makes me nervous that there is a laser beam that's literally a raster scanning around my eyeball, but it's true. Yep. Yes, it is. Exactly. It's a good question. Yep, it's at the boundary of infrared. Exactly. And uh, the last thing I'll mention about is chemical sensing. So like I was saying, those finger clips at the doctor's office, right? That you, those finger clips at the doctor's office that you use to measure absorption and back out oxygen in your blood flow, there's two versions of that that integrated photonics is using right now. One is to sense gas. So this is like a climate change uh, direct um, benefit Gas lines have a lot of residual leakage of methane gas from them in the oil and gas energy industry. And they want to try to build these tiny chips the size of a quarter or a nickel that don't cost more than a dollar, right? Which you can just put almost every 500 feet along these gas lines. And in that way, you can target exactly where leaks occur and then send a construction crew out there to seal it up. There's huge amount of revenue, like, they they say, you know, you can save $50 million on annual expense, expenses. $1.8 billion of revenue gets lost from all these leaky pipelines. Buried in that is a lot of greenhouse gas that's going into the atmosphere, right? So if you could seal all those greenhouse gas leaks, very important benefit. That senses gas by looking at the change in refractive index around these pipes. The thing that the medical doctor does is they look at absorption. And that's the last thing with which I'll stop here. Integrated photonics is now building these kinds of structures called microfluidics, where you have these tiny micron scale channels into which human saliva or blood can stream. And then you can sample that, have a structure on top that passes laser light into it. And then you look at what gets absorbed. You look at the absorption as a function of wavelength. And that's called the chemical fingerprint. And when you do that, you can figure out what's, what's in that sample. From that, you can back out whether there's diseases, et cetera. So these are some of the really radical ways in which integrated photonics is really transforming these four energy areas, industry areas. And then there's more. There is AI. Uh, and with that is something called neuromorphic computing, where people think you can only do AI at room temperature if you use integrated photonics. I don't know if, it's, if that is a solid argument. It's still in the research phase. A lot of people are investigating it. The other place is quantum computing, where they talk about these cool things like entanglement and quantum teleportation. And there, light, we're doing it with light. So people say, why don't we just build quantum computers using light? Professor Dirk Englund is a guy here at MIT. For those of you who want to explore cool internships, who's doing just that. I'll stop there. Happy to take any questions. OK, I think. Uh... Thank you. I, yeah. I think we are running a little uh, behind. So we'll have a one question from the audience and the one question uh, over Zoom. Okay. So very good. Very good. Who wants to ask a question? Thank you. So the question from one of the students was that um, when you have light traveling in a strand of glass, right, if there's incident light from elsewhere that's falling on it, will it interfere with that light signal? And uh, the simplest answer is actually no. You could have that, I could be holding that strand of glass right here. And I have laser light running it through it from left to right, okay? And I'm in a lit room. So I've got light that's coming down from the ceiling here. And when that light falls on the glass fiber, it actually travels right through it. That's why the glass fiber looks transparent to your eyes. It's like the weirdest thing, right? that if you put that light in 90 degrees off, it stays trapped, but otherwise it just passes right through. It's very cool. Good question. So we'll have a one question from online. Uh, Mike, can you select one question? Have the student ask that? Uh, yeah, um, Arnav, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. So my Mike, question was like, oh, there's two Arnavs. I don't know if. There we go. So yeah, my question is um, like modern computers internally, they still obviously use like electrical signals. So when you have these 
uh, like lines going across where they carry their information through optical signals. How is the interfacing happening? And even for the future, when we want to move up most of our computers to uh, optical processing, what's the plan for how that transition can be made? And how do computers use those two signals? And do they overlap? And what processes are done there? That is an excellent question. Excellent. I'm glad you're, I'm real glad you asked that. So the one thing I want to assure you guys is the computer chip is not going away, right? Integrated photonics can't replace integrated circuit chip. It's not possible, not possible because electrons interact with one another and you need that feature when you build transistors, what are called field effect transistors and you build things like uh, thin film transistors uh, for memory applications, computing, computation, logical and or NAND functions, all of that stuff, it's all built on transistors and electrons. You can't do that with photons. People used to say, oh, maybe you can. I don't believe it. I'm willing to go on the record and say, no, you're always gonna need a computer chip. The role of the integrated uh, photonics here, uh, like, like you were saying, the student was saying exactly, it's to relieve the heat load to be that super highway linking these tinier chiplets, okay? The linking is expensive. And that's where companies like Intel and IBM are moving very, very cautiously. At this point, what has Intel done? I'll tell you as an example, they have brought this laser light right up to the doorstep of what you call the package inside which the computer chip resides. And remember, now inside the package, it's no longer one computer chip, it's five or seven or more, right? It's these multi-core or many core packages. They have brought the light right up to the doorstep. At that point, the light gets turned into electrical signal. What my boss has been saying for 20 years is, let's go inside the house. And now let's have that light carry signals from chiplet to chiplet. And that's where people in industry go, hold your horses. That's extremely expensive to design, to manufacture, and to test. You have to make sure these chips meet spec before you put them into products, right? And testing is actually so expensive with photonics that it kind of shuts down the conversation, at least as of now, right? But when I was doing my PhD, I didn't imagine that light was going to reach the package itself. My boss did, but I said, well, whatever. I'm just going to earn my PhD. I like the science, right? But it's reached the package. So maybe in about another 10 years, it'll be routing chiplet to chiplet. But it's, that's the big technical challenge right now. That, that was a very astute question. Thank you. Hey, Mike, uh, do you have two students from your class ready yes. to present a t-shirt? Yeah, Caitlin and Jason, over to you. Um, thank you for the talk today. Like it was, um, I learned a lot and I feel like I want to learn more about this later. So I hope I get to, um, I guess, you know, interact with photonics later on. And, you know, Arnold posted like a really interesting question and I kind of want to explore that too. So, yeah. I'm glad to hear. Thank you. I'm really and glad to hear that. And I think you guys will get a copy of these slides, right? So, oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. And, uh, awesome. Actually, That's awesome. Thank you so much. Fiber. Here it is. Oh, wonderful. And yeah, so um, I said, as an aspiring engineer, I really enjoyed your presentation, but especially how you conceptualized everything with like examples that for some of us, we don't really know much about this topic. So your examples with like the exit sign or ripples in a pond, it really helped with conceptualizing it all and how you put into perspective how photonics quite literally rebuilt the planet. So it was fascinating to hear about how it revolutionized all these areas, you know, from LIDAR to computing or energy. So I, it, it was good to um, have that reminder of, we use this technology every day, but we rarely give consideration to all the underlying infrastructure and physics behind it. So. Thank you for that reminder and thank you for your time today. Ho oh, hope you pleasure. enjoy the shirt. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and I think you said it very eloquently. You know, though the computer chip industry is a victim of its own success. They're so good at hiding those chips from you guys that you guys just think about the apps and the software instead, right? And, and uh, you know, most, uh, most majors in universities right now are computer science degrees. 
And you've got six of these computer chip fabs that are getting built here because of this thing called the Chips Act you guys have heard about. And I will tell you, all the profs are saying, who's going to go work there? We're going to have to give out work visas and bring in people from outside the U.S. because there's not enough majors coming out of college programs in electrical engineering or material science or mechanical engineering. That's where you guys got to fill the ranks. So I think that was really well said. Thank you very much for your comments.